We in the Handara don't want answers. It's hard to avoid them, but we try to. Facts, I don't think I understand. Well, we come here to the fastnesses, mostly to learn what questions not to ask. But you're the answerers. You don't see, Henry, why we perfected and practiced foretelling? No, uh, to exhibit the perfect uselessness of knowing the answer to the wrong question. This season of Extra Sci-Fi is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Use the invite code extra credits at the link below to check out all their videos free for 30 days. He sits in a long hall, cold despite the fire. He's the first mobile, the envoy to an uncontacted world. This world is like his, but unlike his. They are a people of ritual and subtlety. Their customs are long established, so change in this world, from at least his point of view, is slow. And yet it is his job to convince them to join the Ecumen, the confederation of humanoid worlds which he serves. But it's more than their customs and their rituals he doesn't understand. It's their very biology. The people here are sexually androgynous, and only for a few days out of every month do they take on a gender. They go through phases of gender expression until they take on a male or a female aspect for procreation. But even then, their gender isn't fixed. A person may be both a mother and a father during their lifetime. They may swap what role they express each month, not even having words for fixed gender. And here he is, about to meet their king. A radio quietly plays. It just told him that his one ally, his one supporter on this alien world, has just been exiled for treason. The Left Hand of Darkness is fundamentally a novel about isolation and exclusion. But it's not about the isolation of space. It's about the isolation of existing in a society you fundamentally don't understand, and that very fundamentally doesn't understand you. It challenges all of the tropes, so tacitly accepted by the Golden Age writers. It places a heterosexual male character in a world where he not only isn't dominant, but where he's seen as a perversion, where he's looked at with horror and disgust. It does so as a metaphor, as a lens that forces us to look at some of our preconceptions. It forces us to consider what it means to be marginalized, or worse, reviled, simply for who you are. And it forces us to consider questions of gender and sexuality. It's one of the standout works of a movement in sci-fi that came into being alongside the new wave. A movement that came out of the women's movement of the 60s and 70s that looked at what was going on in the world, especially in America, and yearned to extrapolate forward. To explore the idea of gender roles, and to ask the question, what would the world look like without them? Because while science fiction as a genre began with a female writer, female voices had been largely absent from sci-fi until this period. Now, though, at last, a group of women, armed with the ideals of the 60s and 70s, would begin to open the genre up, taking home a number of Hugo and Nebula awards over the next decade, and paving the way for people like Margaret Atwood and Octavia Butler to keep pushing the genre forward. Sometimes these early female authors are considered part of the new wave. Sometimes they're given a separate category, like feminist science fiction. But however you want to categorize them, they were doing what sci-fi does best. Asking big questions that make us rethink our society, our beliefs, and who we are. And Ursula K. Le Guin was uniquely positioned to ask those questions. Her parents were anthropologists. They were perhaps best known for their friendship with, and later books about, a man who is often considered to have been the last Native American not to have real contact with Western settlers. He died while Ursula was young, but she was raised on stories of this man, a man who had no name because there was no one left alive to name him. She was raised on stories of a people seen as foreign or alien and thus driven to extinction by people who didn't understand them. And famous academics and scientists like Robert Oppenheimer were frequent house guests at her home. Through them, from a very young age, she was exposed to the cutting edge of science and the most radical ideas of the academic world. Even their dinner table conversation would later serve as fodder for her books. But let's jump back into the left hand of darkness, because it not only forced male readers and writers to see the human experience from another perspective, it asked us to question the value of a fundamentally gendered society. The main character, I, is tasked with bringing a new world into the confederation of planets he belongs to. But he starts the book with a very rigid way of thinking. And part of the genius of this book is the evolution of his character. He starts as the stereotypical male sci-fi protagonist you'd find in almost any piece of Golden Age sci-fi. He's the man of reason. He sees the world through a lens of pure logic and is at a loss when other people don't view the world in the same way. He believes in material prosperity and sees it as one of the benchmarks of success of a society. So he's flabbergasted when he lays out all of the wonders of technology that the Ecumen could offer the Gethin, the world he's an envoy to, and they're simply not interested. He doesn't understand how others might see spiritual or cultural ideals as the benchmark of a society, and this prevents him from being able to fulfill his mission. 
Yet, over the course of his journey, he slowly comes to shed some of what might have been called his traditionally masculine ideas, opening up to a more emotive existence, and becomes both a more effective envoy and a better rounded person because of it. This book makes us ask, if he hadn't grown up in a society divided by gender, if he hadn't been inculcated with the ideas of how a man should think and how a man should act, could much of the suffering in the story have been avoided? It's a powerful book filled with questions that get right down to the core of who we are. It doesn't ask that we approach it with an open mind, but rather it hopes to open our minds as it goes. And if we, like the character I, can get there, it promises to leave us with a broader perspective and ready to explore the tradition of feminist and anthropological sci-fi that extends right down to today. Thanks again to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this season of Extra Sci-Fi. Created by John Hendricks, the founder of the Discovery Channel, CuriosityStream is the world's first streaming service dedicated to the lifelong quest to learn, explore, and understand. And you know, actually, something as a New Yorker I've been wanting to understand is how the heck cities are going to function with all of the problems humanity faces in the future. But after a quick search on CuriosityStream, I found the series Cities of Tomorrow that covered both the potential changes and solutions in future urban living. What up, vertical farming? I didn't even think of that. So if you're looking to grow your knowledge in topics spanning science, nature, history, and technology, subscriptions start at just $2.99 a month or $19.99 a year. But if you head to curiositystream.com slash extra credits and use the invite code extra credits, you can future-proof your decision and get your first month free.